Welcome to this week's uh, linguistics department seminar. Our speaker today is Pedro Scarazzareas from very close by, the University of Westminster, and he's going to talk to us about um, Cypriot Greek um, in London. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. So, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's really nice to be here, just from the corner from both um, home and work, uh, right here in um, the center of London. So, um, today I'm going to give you some. Um, findings from um, a research initiative um, that started uh, in 2013 uh, looking at um, Cypriot Greek as a community or heritage language uh, here in London. So um, this project started in 2013 with a uh, British Academy Postdoctoral Fellowship um, that I was awarded to investigate the development of heritage grammars in present day London looking at Cypriot Greek in particular. Um, then in 2015, I moved to my, uh, my current um, institution, the University of Westminster, where I was very um, uh, lucky and grateful to receive uh, further funding to complete the project that I started in 2015 by putting together uh, a corpus of spoken British Cypriot Greek. Uh, last year, I was um, uh, also awarded a British Academy Rising Star Engagement Award uh, to start working on how we could um, communicate the findings of this research to a wider audience outside academia. And currently we are um, working, uh, by way I mean uh, uh, me and my research assistant Alexandra Duryu, who's uh, over there at the back, uh, we're currently working on a project on attitudes towards Cypriot Greek and Standard Modern Greek uh, among Lind London's Greek Cypriot community, and we're looking particularly at the role of Greek supplementary schools. And this summer we're going to start uh, another project with a colleague from the University of Cyprus, Elena Ionivu, uh, looking particular at Greek-speaking Turkish Cypriots in London. So this is, uh, I'm telling you all this to show that the data that you'll see today um, come from a wide different, a, a, a range of different projects um, centered around uh, different aspects of um, uh, London's Greek Cypriot community and uh, its language and languages. So today I want to situate Cypriot Greek um, in the multilingual context of London. Uh, I will describe um, some of its uh, linguistic characteristics and I'm going to put forward a working hypothesis about its social status, the social status it has in this context. And in particular the, the hypothesis I'm going to put together is that the intergenerational transmission and maintenance of Cypriot Greek, that is the fact uh, that is whether it will be passed on to new generations of speakers, uh, is threatened not only by English as a majority language, as is uh, most commonly assumed, uh, but also by negative attitudes towards Cypriot Greek from within the community itself. Uh, in particular, I believe and I, arg I argue um, that Cypriot Greek in London is threatened by ideas that it is an inferior form of Greek uh, that have been transplanted from Cyprus and which were further reinforced here in London. Uh, also by the community's complementary school and the way uh, that they engender attitudes towards Cypriot Greek and standard modern Greek in their teaching and also by negative attitudes of speakers from Cyprus towards the way Cypriot Greek has been preserved in London and is spoken by members of the diaspora here in London. So um, I want to start with the big picture. Uh, so London, I'm sure you uh, will have heard that people refer to it as a melting pot uh, of languages and cultures uh, and these are just some, uh, some headings from newspapers and news outlets referring to London as Europe's new ethnic melting pot uh, or melting pot London. London is a melting pot, we should keep it this way. Now this is very um, it has become somewhat of a cliche, uh, although I, uh, I don't like it very much and I take issue with this uh, metaphor because if you, um, if you try and deconstruct it, what you're really saying is that London is a pot and you put stuff in it and you bring it to a high temperature and all the individual ingredients melt and they lose their individual characteristics and they fuse into a new kind of product um, that comes out of the melting pot. So basically what this metaphor implies is that the in many different languages and cultures that are present in London are no longer preserved as, in, as individual um, elements of its multilingual, multicultural um, uh, backdrop. 
So instead of this, I prefer to refer to London as a linguistic mosaic, not only because it's a Greek word, but also because I think it reflects better um, the, uh, the reality of it. So what is a mosaic? It's basically a picture of a pattern that's made up of smaller individual elements, like tiles, uh, stones, um, gems. So uh, these individual elements are put together to form a nice picture like the one you, you see here from a uh, Roman villa in Corinth. Um, the, the nice thing about this is that if you go close, if you start examining it, you will be able to discern the individual tiles uh, and the place they occupy in putting together this um, nice picture. So this is one of the, uh, the alternatives that I, I uh, argue for in terms of uh, describing London's uh, linguistic reality. And what is this reality? The reality is that um, between 200 and 300 languages are spoken by London's pupils. And uh, we refer here to London's pupils because these are, um, this is the most safe metric that we have of establishing the city's linguistic diversity. Now you see a range there between 200 and 300 languages, and this is basically due to differences in, in what we consider to be a language and what we consider to be a variety of a language for bean counting purposes. Uh, whichever the figure, uh, the reality is that London is a very diverse linguistic mosaic, and 40 of those languages are spoken by more than 1,000 pupils uh, in London. And of course, each pupil comes with a family and a family background, so you can think of 40 languages that are being quite widespread um, in London. Now, here you see um, the top 15 languages uh, of London for the years 2000, sorry, 1999 and 2008. Uh, in 1999, uh, Greek was on the table, on the top 15, um, to, uh, 11th position. In 2008, uh, uh, Greek is no longer in the top 15 uh, languages spoken other than English in London, um, because the, we have some new entries, most notably uh, Polish and other uh, European languages that uh, were transplanted anew to London uh, after the 2004 expansion of the European Union. So, there is extraordinary linguistic variety in London, and this should come uh, as news to no one, uh, because we live here, we know the reality, we know that many different languages are spoken on the street, uh, at, ho at homes and schools and, and workplaces. So, London is, uh, London's linguistic diversity comes from the fact that uh, a lot of different ethno-linguistic communities are present in the city, and these can be established, they can, uh, they can have a history of uh, many decades of presence in, in London, or they might be more recently arrived uh, communities. Or in certain cases, you have an established group and a recently arrived group from the same, uh, the same country of origin. So depending on the history of the community, you can have first generation, second generation, third generation, or nth generation of speakers of languages other than English. We have a large number of different home, homelands, different home countries <coughs> uh, with differences in the historical connections they have to the UK. Now, for example, looking at the particular example of, uh, of Cyprus, we know that Cyprus has had quite strong ties with the UK uh, historically in recent centuries. Other countries, like my home country, Greece, don't necessarily have this, uh, that, this closer connection with the UK historically. Um, communities differ in terms of the nature of migration, what is it, uh, what are the reasons are for them migrating to, uh, to the UK, are they um, sort of much more cosmopolitan communities that came for, because they were able to, because it was their choice, or were they communities because they, um, they had to move in search of a better life, and of course the timing of migration. And of course there are differences in the degrees of heritage language maintenance. Uh, and shift to English. So some communities are known to preserve their home languages better, uh, at, by better I mean to more generations than other communities who shift to English uh, sooner. So today I want to talk to you about two different aspects of looking at, at, at these uh, languages. And the first one is heritage, the notion of heritage language and heritage speaker. So who are heritage speakers? So let's have a hypothetical scenario of uh, two uh, speakers, Kostas and Maria, they are originally from Greece. Um, they speak Greek, which they uh, started acquiring from birth. Age acquisition is zero. So in terms of the order of acquisition, uh, Greek is their L1, their first language. And then, uh, at the age of 12, they go to, say, a language school and they start learning 
English. So English, in terms of the order of acquisition, will be the L2, the second language. When, when Costas and Maria fall in love, and they decide to move somewhere else, let's say Chicago, United States of America. And there they have three children, Athena, Tula, and Nick. So Athena, Tula, and Nick grew up in a Greek-speaking household, so they start acquiring Greek from the age of zero, from birth. So Greek is their um, first language. But at the age of five, they go to mainstream school, where they are exposed to English, the majority language of their society. So English becomes their L2 in terms of the order of acquisition, because it's the second language that they start acquiring. But because they develop English as their dominant language, because they use it as uh, uh, for most of the time at school, uh, they only speak Greek at home, English then becomes their dominant language. And this is what the shaded cell means. And then Athena, Tula, and Nick have children, and they grow up speaking both Greek and English at home. So they hear Greek being spoken by their parents and their grandparents, but their parents are American-born in this case, so they also speak a lot of English at home. So these children grow up with two first languages in the best case scenario. So the second and third generation are what we refer to as heritage speakers of Greek in this case. So they acquire Greek, their heritage language, from birth, but later on they become dominant in another language, uh, in this case English. So this kind of acquisitional trajectory has been shown to share um, characteristics with both first language acquisition and adult second language acquisition in terms of both the previous linguistic knowledge that speakers have when they acquire the heritage language and in terms of their input, which is a crucial bit. So um, looking specifically at inputs, we know that because heritage speakers are born in the context of speaking their heritage language at home from birth, that they have an early exposure to it. The exposure is naturalistic and almost exclusively oral. That means they, they only get to, to hear their heritage language but they don't have abundant and frequent uh, amount of input because at the age of five they move to uh, the school setting where English sort of dominates um, the majority of tasks that are called to do in that language. So they have varying amounts of input and it's also less varied and contextually restricted because they only speak the uh, home language at home and the majority language in other, or other contexts. So the competence and performance of heritage speakers differ uh, from that of both monolinguals and second language speakers in all grammatical domains. And both are extremely variable, not only across different speakers, but also along the lifespan of the same individual. So which means that we'll have uh, two speakers uh, who are heritage speakers of the same language. They come from very similar settings, the same amounts of exposure, the same years of um, exposure to Greek and English, for example, and the, the way they speak Greek will be very, very different. So one will be very, a, a more fluent speaker and the other will not be a very fluent speaker. Or even within the same individual, we might find cases whereby the younger someone is, the better their uh, competence is in the heritage language, but later on in life, this might deteriorate or the opposite. Uh, in terms of linguistic features, it has been found that certain aspects of um, grammatical structure and uh, also of, uh, pronunciation uh, are particularly vulnerable to in heritage speakers. So in terms of phonetics, certain values of sounds have been found to be particularly vulnerable to um, differences in the heritage language. In terms of morphosyntax, uh, features like the inflection, agreement or case in nouns, and tense aspect mood and agreement in verbs have been found to be particularly vulnerable to changes in heritage language speakers. And of course in syntax, null pronouns, anaphores and word order are three um, phenomena that have been identified as particularly interesting in looking at heritage uh, speakers. Uh, Sorry, can I ask you, is the, is the previous um, generalization based only on heritage speakers learn connected to English or any kind of pair of languages? Now these come from, um, in most studies out there, the majority language will be English and the heritage language will be something else. 
usually Spanish Russian because the, the, um, uh, the majority of the studies at least in early times came from the United States and these are the two major uh, heritage language speaker groups but now studies are becoming more um, uh, the, we have more work being done on other heritage languages and this is one of the um, of the cause of uh, people working in heritage linguistics that we need more evidence from uh, other languages. But the first, um, first studies uh, focused on, on these features. And also they also identified uh, four main reasons why heritage speakers um, have different competence and performance in these domains. Uh, the first one is attrition. Uh, it's the notion that um, uh, children acquire the features of their heritage language but later on in life they stop using them or they stop using them as frequently as non-heritage speakers so these features become attrited, they, they become weakened. A second reason is interrupted acquisition, the idea that um, uh, acquisition starts at birth for heritage speakers but is some interrupted at the age of five when they move on to the school setting. So uh, features and, and aspects of the heritage language that are normally acquired or perfected after the age of five or six or seven uh, will not be the same as in monolingual speakers. Of course, we have transfer from the majority language because don't forget that these speakers become dominant in um, the, the, the society, the majority language, so this will affect the way they, um, they speak their heritage language and of course differences in the input. So for example, if um, the input of uh, the type of heritage language that's spoken in the diasporic setting differs from the type that's spoken in the home country, this will have an effect on the type of language that heritage speakers speak. So far there have been two major quantitative approaches to heritage linguistics from this uh, type of background, the experimental one that uh, draws on the uh, methodology and theory of language acquisition uh, and uses predominantly psycholinguistic methods. And uh, more recently there was a comparative uh, variationist approach that has been developed looking at a social linguistic uh, methodology and Labovian methods to um, uh, heritage languages and the results are very divergent. So for example looking at uh, prodrop, uh, the prodrop parameter, experimental studies do show that heritage speakers do not perform identically to monolingual so they have different uh, competences and performances in uh, in their heritage languages compared to monolingual speakers, but most variationist studies on heritage speakers of Spanish living in the United States do not show any contact effects. So this is a, a gap that needs to be bridged somehow. Uh, NARG 2015 argues that there are differences in the methodology of the two approaches that may be responsible for the differences in the outcomes, and the general recommendation is that the same speakers must be investigated using both methods in any future research. So this is the heritage um, linguistic um, aspect of looking at languages like Cypriot Greek in, uh, in London. Now we're moving on to the more social linguistic um, uh, aspect of looking at it. So remember the three generations of, um, of, of heritage speakers. Yeah, we have the first generation, the parents, who are dominant in the native language. In this case, for example, we're going to talk about, uh, this will be Greek, Cypriot Greek. And the first generation is non-native in the majority language, in our case English, which means that the first generation, the ones who transplant, who bring the home language to the, uh, the UK, for example, we speak English with uh, some sort of accent or fossilized uh, grammatical, um, ungrammatical uh, ways of talking. Then in the second generation, we have what, um, what is very important in terms of the vitality of um, heritage languages, which is a shift in dominance. So while the first generation is dominant in the native language, the second generation is dominant in the majority language. The children of the first generation, for example, will be dominant in English. They will speak English most of the time. And they will have low to high proficiency in the heritage language. They might be very good at it, or they might be quite bad at it. And then when we move to the third generation, of course, dominance remains the same. The third generation, the grandchildren of the first generation, will be dominant in the majority language. And in terms of the heritage language, their proficiency will range from intermediate to low, or they might not speak the heritage language at all. So this clearly paints um, a scenario of language shift, which is that by the third generation, uh, the heritage language is on its way out in communities that have uh, heritage languages spoken at home. 
Now, uh, quite early uh, in 1977, Giles and others um, tried to capture the social factors that um, can sort of predict whether a language will be passed on to the next generation or not. They, they termed this the ethno-linguistic vitality of a language, um, and they identified th uh, three key uh, um, areas, let's say, state, uh, status, demography, and institutional support. So the idea is, for example, that um, if um, a language has economic status, if it's considered to be um, uh, useful to get a job or to make uh, a career in this world, then this language has a higher index of ethno-linguistic vitality than a language that is not considered to be useful in inverted commas. So you see there are different, um, uh, different types of factors, so economic status, social status, um, its use in education, government services, the mass media, uh, and I want today to focus on language status both within and without the community itself. This refers to whether a language or uh, a linguistic variety will be considered to be uh, prestigious or non-prestigious, both by other speakers and speakers themselves. And this is because, according to Worm, one of the most important factors for the maintenance and reinvigoration of heritage of a threatened language is the attitude of the speakers towards their own language and the importance which they attach to it as a major symbol of their identity. The idea being that if speakers consider the language, their own language to be an important part of their identity and to have um, uh, to be important generally in life, they are more likely uh, to speak it to their children and to pass it on to the next generation. So what are language attitudes? So we know that in most speech communities, if not all of them, uh, a given variety will be considered proper, correct and good. And this will be the variety that we call the standard. In all, in all other varieties, it will be deemed improper. Uh, incorrect, bad, or sub or non-standard. So in the English context, for example, especially in Britain, um, it used to be RP, received pronunciation, that was considered to be the standard. Uh, now we refer to Southern Standard British uh, English, the variety of Southern English spoken in the south uh, of England. And all other varieties, say for example Birmingham uh, English or Bromley, is considered to be something like a, a substandard or bad variety of English. Now, these ideas about linguistic improperness, we know that they develop through complex socio-historical processes. Yeah, they take a long time and different types of social and historical circumstances um, to take shape. However, once they are established, they are transmitted to new generations of speakers through education, uh, governmental policy and other institutional systems that add value to these ideas. However, as linguists, we know that ideas about linguistic properness and improperness are not based on any objective facts about language itself. We know that they are based on subjective, preconceived opinions about what language ought to be like. And we know that essentially all these attitudes represent attitudes towards particular groups of speakers. So when, for example, we say that, um, I don't know, Geordie, sounds bad, essentially what we're expressing is a negative attitude towards the, spe the people who speak Geordie and not the linguistic variety itself. So what does, what does that mean? That means that language attitudes essentially reflect relations of power and status. So the people who speak RP are the ones who ha are more socially powerful uh, and also in economical terms. The people who don't speak RP or who speak other non-standard varieties of English are the ones who lack somewhat in power and status in uh, this speech community. And everywhere where you have differences of power, you have important social, cultural, political, educational and economic ramifications. And the final theoretical point I want to make before I delve into the Greek Cypriot case um, is the fact that um, we know, I mentioned before, that there are up to two or three hundred languages being spoken in London, and I showed you a nice uh, table with the top 15 languages. But, and this is the current approach to linguistic, uh, linguistic diversity. However, Diversity and variation within multilingual settings is largely disregarded. So, for example, today I'm going to talk to you about two different uh, varieties of Greek, Standard Greek and Cypriot Greek. But this 
uh, important distinction between the two um, is not taken into account in any discussions about the linguistic diversity of cities. So community languages are discussed using broad labels such as Bengali, Urdu, Somali, Arabic. And especially if you think about uh, the diversity within Arabic, it's crazy to say that Arabic is one language and give it one label as one language is spoken in, uh, in London. So the multiplicity of social and linguistic issues that arise from the use of different varieties of these languages in a wide array of contexts of private and public community life is overlooked. So my work is situated in this idea that we need to take into account um, the diversity within multilingualism and multilingual diversity such as in, in London. So moving on to the, the case study for today, um, I'm going to mainly be talking about two modern Greek varieties. On the one hand we have standard modern Greek which is the official language of the Hellenic Republic, which is Greece, and one of the two official languages of the Republic of Cyprus, the other one being Turkish. And on the other hand, we have Cypriot Greek, which refers to the modern Greek varieties that are spoken in Cyprus, not variety, because we know that even within Cyprus, uh, there are differences in the way Cypriot Greek is spoken on the island. And uh, people on, from Cyprus, uh, are able to say where someone is from by the way, uh, from the way they speak uh, Cypriot Greek. So Cypriot Greek is in no way a uniform uh, dialect. There is no such thing as a uniform dialect. Um, but for the purpose of today, I'm going to be using Cypriot Greek to refer collectively to all these different forms of uh, Greek uh, that we find in Cyprus. So um, this is a map uh, where it shows you um, Greece on uh, on uh, the left and Cyprus on the on the uh, bottom um, um, bottom right hand corner, um, and this is an important map. It's in Greek because I want to make a point. I don't want to confuse you with the Greek. Uh, the map says at the top it's published by the Parliament of Greeks, which is the Parliament of Greece, and it says historical map of Greece, and you see all the different lands uh, in the Balkans and uh, Asia Minor that are or have been uh, part of the Greek state at some point in its history and you see the different dates at which they were added or lost from uh, Greek uh, territory uh, or Greek sovereign territory. And you see for example that Turkey is uh, for the most part painted white, Bulgaria is white, Albania is white, but Cyprus is colourful. So why would uh, you include Cyprus in a map of Greece? This tells you something about the relations between the two countries. Uh, the two uh, countries consider themselves to be part of the same uh, larger nation, uh, especially, of course, the Greek Cypriot population of Cyprus considers uh, that they ha are somehow related ethnically, nationally, historically, religiously uh, to Greece. Um, of course, there is a Turkish uh, Cypriot population uh, on Cyprus that see no connection with Greece whatsoever. But for the Greek-speaking majority of Cyprus, there is, to a certain extent, an association uh, with Greece. Um, I don't know how many of you have been in Cyprus. If you have been in Cyprus, uh, you might have been surprised to see the Greek flag being flown uh, on Cyprus. Which, if you take a step back and think about it, why would you fly the flag of another country? In yes, but but why? Um, it's in the constitution, it's constitutional, so it, on the Cypriot constitution it, it says that uh, individuals in Cyprus are free to fly the, the Greek and Turkish flags, uh, which shows you that the national and political situation between the two countries is complicated to say the least. So Cypriot Greek, the dialect, was, has traditionally been divided into 18 uh, different regional varieties. Uh, there you see the island of Cyprus and you see different um, uh, numbers. So the larger area in, uh, with number one is the uh, Mesaoria Plain, uh, which is where the capital Nicosia is found. Uh, you see, for example, uh, Karpasia at the, the pointy bit with number four. And historically, uh, Greek dialectologists uh, had identified different varieties of Cypriot Greek being spoken in, uh, in these areas. Um, now you see all the references are from 1970, of the 1970s, um, after the 1974 war between um, 
Cyprus, uh, Greece and Turkey. Uh, we know there was a lot of population movements on the island. Uh, people were displaced from their original uh, point, uh, places of residence and there was a move uh, of urbanization uh, to, and a move towards larger cities. And uh, unsurprisingly, this movement of populations, even within such a small island, led to a leveling of intra-dialectal differences. So the, uh, this led to the emergence of a pan cypriot koine that is still uh, being formed, a more uniform form of Cypriot Greek that is spoken in Cyprus at the moment. Uh, that said, that doesn't mean that regional differences are no longer there, they're just not as pronounced as they used to be 30, 40 or 50 years ago. Now the two, um, uh, the two varieties, uh, Cypriot Greek and Standard Modern Greek, are very different linguistically. Here you see some linguistic features uh, that differentiate the two varieties. So for example, Cypriot Greek has uh, double consonants and these are uh, uh, distinctive. Uh, in Standard Modern Greek there's no distinction between single or double consonants. Um, uh, K and H turn into CH and SH before the uh, front, um, uh, front vowels in Cypriot Greek. They turn to K to K and H in, uh, in Standard Greek. Uh, you have differences in uh, stress uh, patterns. So, for example, in Cypriot Greek, you can have a word stressed in the fourth syllable to the end. In Standard Greek, you can only have uh, a st the stress up to the third syllable from the end of the word. You have differences in the form of uh, nouns and verbs. Uh, so, there you see uh, a specific a verbal form, ephenetun, it seemed. Uh, the equivalent in Standard Greek is fenotan. The only thing that's uh, the same is the, the root fen, everything else is different. You have differences in the syntax of object clitics um, and of course differences in the vocabulary including false friends like synthetiras which in Cypriot Greek means a stapler whereas in Standard Greek it's a paper clip. So um, forget about the details, this shows you basically that uh, the moment someone opens their mouth everyone knows if they're from Greece or if they're from Cyprus. So, uh, and depending on the degree to which they use features of the dialect, the, di the two varieties can be thought to be uh, mutually unintelligible. Uh, that said, of course, speakers of Cypriot Greek are quite exposed to Standard Greek, so it's easier for, uh, it's not difficult for them to understand Standard Greek, but speakers of Standard Greek who have had no exposure to Cypriot Greek can sometimes have difficulty understanding. So in terms of the relation of the two uh, varieties in Cyprus, um, early accounts viewed the two varieties as being in a diglossic situation in uh, the uh, traditional sense of Ferguson. So standard modern Greek uh, is the high code and Cypriot Greek is the low code. So standard modern Greek is a language that you find in a speech in parliament, in a university lecture uh, or a news broadcast. And Cypriot Greek is the language that you use uh, to talk with your family, friends and colleagues and maybe you can find it in folk literature. Um, but Cypriot Greek has the advantage that it is the language that is naturally acquired by its speakers. So it's the language that is transmitted to new generations. Standard Modern Greek is a language that is taught at schools. So unless uh, a speaker goes to school, they have very minimal exposure and competence in, in Standard uh, Greek. So this is the traditional account um, that sort of uh, sees that uh, the, the relationship between the two dialects as somewhat complementary. You use one there and the other one there. Although more recent proposals um, by a series of scholars have described the relation between the two uh, in terms of a register or stylistic uh, continuum. That means that uh, you have a range of uh, different registers. Uh, on the one hand you have basilectal registers, this means registers that have a high um, proportion of regional features uh, and this, this register in Cyprus is labelled uh, vareta, telia, or pola horkatika, which means uh, heavy total peasantry, basically, so village talk. And at the other end of it, you have the acro acrolectal register, which is one that incorporates um, uh, a high number of features from Standard Greek. Uh, it's called kalamaristika, means uh, pen pusher uh, talk. And this comes from uh, the idea that this is the language that's only uh, allowed to be written. And in between, you have those mesolectal registers, something like sostasis, that is men, sort of tidied up Cypriot Greek. You, you do away with all the very heavy um, features. And of course, more closer to uh, kalamaristika, you have evgenika kypriaka, or polite. Cypriot uh, Greek. 
Uh, now, there was a bit of um, discussion about this. So, Arvanit, for example, said that the two models, the Diglossian model and the register model, are not mutually um, uh, exclu uh, mutually exclusive uh, because Ferguson's model, the Diglossian one, accounts for the perceptions and expectations the speakers have as to which variety is appropriate in which context. And it is a reality that speakers of Cypriot Greek know what they are supposed to speak with what, uh, with who and when. And also the fact that there is a verb in Cypriot Greek called kalamarizo, which means to speak like a pen pusher, which shows you that this type of uh, uh, register is a reality for them. So Cariolem was sort of tried to, um, to marry the two uh, at, uh, pr uh, approaches uh, in talking about a perceptual diglossia. So the speakers perceive two opposing t styles of talking, but in reality what they do is they move on, on, this, um, uh, on this continuum con uh, all the time. So depending on who they are talking to, in which context, about what, they might move towards the more best electoral register, and when they move to an, an, another context where they know they sh should sound more uh, proper, they move on to the uh, acroelectral register. But this, doesn't, this allows for different combinations of features from the dialect and uh, the standard. So this, whatever the situation, we know that in... Um, we have evidence from the 1990s that the two, uh, the two different varieties, the Cypriot Greek and Standard Greek, uh, are viewed very differently by speakers of Cypriot Greek. So um, in Papa Pavlou's Match Guys test, Cypriot Greek speakers rated people who spoke standard Greek as more attractive, more modern, more ambitious, more dependable, more intelligent, more pleasant, more interesting, and more educated. Which shows you that standard Greek has what we call uh, overt prestige. It's the variety that, uh, that uh, makes you sound all these things. However, uh, speakers of Cypriot Greek sound more sincere, more kind, more friendly, and more humorous which shows you that Cypriot Greek has um, what we call covert prestige. It's the language of solidarity amongst speakers of Cypriot Greek, but the one that will bring you forward in life is standard uh, Greek. Uh, later on, uh, Papa Pavlou and Sophocleus in, in further studies um, identified certain aspects of the dialect as being perceived as, as especially rural, peasant-like and unappealing. And uh, what they identified was the two sounds, sh and j. Uh, these are sounds that do not exist in standard Greek and they're very easily spotted when someone is, is talking. So if they say sh and j, or if a word has sh and j, then you know that this is a separate word and not a standard uh, Greek word. And in 2009, Papa Pavlou and Sophocleus found that um, speakers associate the Basilectal Register, Vareta Horkatika, the heavy peasantry, uh, with a very rural way of life and a low level of education. And, and on the other hand, Standard Greek is associated with uh, politeness. So they, um, uh, they concluded that um, this indicates certain feelings of inferiority uh, when you have speakers telling you that Cypriot Greek is not a correct language. And where does all this come from? It comes from uh, education. But Pavlo and Pavlo talked about the covert language policy in Cyprus that only accepts standard Greek uh, as the language of instruction at all levels. And sometimes this will be expressed through circulars such as this uh, from 2002 that says that educators should use standard modern Greek during class time and they should expect the same from their students. The Greek Cypriot dialect is respected and can be used by students in certain cases for communication, such as in role plays representing scenes from everyday life when reciting poems, etc. The above mention should be performed within logical boundaries and not at the expense of the development of standard modern Greek, which constitutes our national language. So you see there the idea that you should, the, the, the desired uh, effect is for, stu for pupils to acquire standard Greek, the national language that ties Cyprus with Greece. So driven by uh, these guidelines, I'm just going to skip this, um, driven by these guidelines, teachers in, uh, in Cyprus have been found through a number of research uh, publications that they actively discourage the use of Cypriot Greek in the classroom on behalf of the students through explicit corrections. They code switch to Cypriot Greek only in informal instances of communication, in encouragement and commenting, but then they switch again to standard Greek when they want to assert their authority. 
But they mean that they, the minute they leave the classroom, they mean they, leave, they walk out of the door, they use simply agree with colleagues and students outside the classroom. So think of this paranoid situation. The same person speaks to you in two different uh, varieties. They expect, this, they expect you to speak only one of them, and you have to work out which one is which and which one to use with the same person in different uh, situations. And God forbid you cannot use Cypriot Greek when you write or when you uh, talk about your, uh, your class material. So this is an example from an in-class observation in a uh, Greek Cypriot school done by uh, Elena Ioannidou, published in 2009. So Erato is the teacher and um, she's asking uh, miss, what will we do? Now, this isn't uh, a language class, this is an art class. So basically, the, the, the pupil is asking, are we going to paint, are we going to sing, are we going to, I don't know, create something with uh, cart and paper or whatever. And the teacher says, not what will we do, but what will we do? where she basically picks up on the use of enna, which is a separate uh, future marker, and she corrects the student, uh, repeating the correct, the standard Greek marker. Now, what's uh, interesting about this instance is that Erato's original question uh, doesn't include only one separate Greek feature, but two of them. So the verb form kamume, for we do, is also Cypriot Greek. The equivalent in Standard Greek would be kanume with an N instead of an M. But the speaker, the teacher doesn't pick up on it because it's not high on her hierarchy of Cypriot, Cypriotness or linguistic Cypriotness. So, which shows you that what the, the teacher is asking the student to produce is a mixed utterance, one that includes features of Standard Greek but also some features of Cypriot Greek, which sort of go below the radar. So, uh, moving on to the UK context now. So, what do we find here? So, um, the UK has been traditionally uh, uh, the top destination for Cypriot migrants. Uh, Costandino identifies uh, five different uh, periods or phases in uh, the migration of Cypriots from Cyprus uh, to the UK. Um, now, uh, if you don't know much about uh, Cyprus, you might be tempted to think that the majority of the migrants arrived after 1974 and the war, but that is not true. The majority of the migrants arrived between 1960 and 1963. Uh, Cyprus became independent in 1960, and uh, reportedly there was a feeling of um, insecurity as to whether Cyprus could make it on its own as an independent country. It hadn't been one in its history. It's a very small um, island in the Mediterranean, so a lot of uh, people thought uh, it would be better if they uh, migrated to the United Kingdom. Also, the Commonwealth Immigrants Act that was passed in 1962 um, played a big role. Now, before 1962, uh, citizens of the Commonwealth um, could uh, move to the UK and work and live here without the need of a residence or work permit, uh, which is basically what happened to the Windrush generation. Uh, in 1962, uh, the British government decided that there should be a limit to the number of migrants that were able to come in from Commonwealth countries uh, and that they would need, there would be tighter controls in the number of them that would be coming in. So uh, citizens from all the different Commonwealth countries knew that the Arc was going to pass, so they made their way to the UK before the act was passed, uh, which is basically what's going to happen with Brexit and the deadline of the 29th of March 2019. So today, uh, there is a large proportion of uh, Cypriots living in, uh, in the UK, and especially in London. Uh, if we try and find information, now the Office for National Statistics is one source, but it only gives you the number of Cypriot-born UK residents, which is basically the first generation. It doesn't record any information about the children of the first generation. So according to the National Federation of Cypriots in the UK, there are between 200 and 300,000 UK residents with a Cypriot background. Now this might seem small compared to the overall population of London or to that of other communities, but if you think that the population of Cyprus as a whole is a little under one million people, you do realize that London might be the most, the city with the largest uh, Cypriot population and not Nicosia or Larnaca or Limassol. 
Uh, in London, the majority of these uh, uh, migrants live in London and especially in uh, these five northernmost uh, boroughs, uh, Enfield, Barnard, Haringey, Islington and Camden. And there you see uh, the percentage of, stu of school students, school pupils who declare Greek as their home language. So for example, in Enfield, that's 2.6. And if you think there's a choice of 300 languages, you do realize this is quite a high percentage. The community is very, um, uh, is, uh, is very visible, especially in those areas around uh, Palmer's Green, Southgate, uh, Wood Green. Um, it's a very um, active community. They have um, shops, uh, churches, community centers, schools, uh, newspapers, uh, radio stations, uh, TV channels. So looking first at the linguistic features of uh, the, uh, the community, what do we find? We find three main, um, uh, three main features. We find basilectal features that originate in the local Cypriot varieties that were brought over by the first generation. So uh, within quotes like peasanty features um, that the first generation brought over from Cyprus. Then we have acrolectal features, that is uh, st standard features that gain prestige through the community education system, the church and the media. And of course we have contact effects from English. And here I've tried to sort of capture the degree to which we find uh, these features. So with the first generation, we find a, lot, a more intense, um, a higher number of basilectal features, whereas with the second and third generations, we find, uh, unsurprisingly, more contact effects and more acrolectal features from standard Greek. So looking at basilectal features, what do we find? So we find everything, really, especially lexical items. Um, so words like mavluka for pillow, uh, or poate for here, these are words that in Cyprus are no longer used, or at least if they are used, they are considered to be uh, quite rural and old fashioned, whereas they're still used uh, normally uh, in London. We also find uh, phonological variants, so for example, uh, the alternation between th and h in lachos for mistake instead of lathos, uh, or that between th and th in afimume for I remember instead of afimume, uh, which uh, are both still in Cyprus, used in Cyprus, but they are on their way out. Um, and also morphological variants such as Ioni for the first person uh, pronoun instead of Ero. At the same time, we find features that are from standard Greek, like then for the negate instead of N, Catalaveno uh, instead of Catalavo for understand, and also certain phonological variants that you wouldn't expect to find in, pe in people who speak Cypriot Greek uh, between them. So uh, if one person from Cyprus speaks to another person from Cyprus, they w they're not likely to say calocheri for some other. They're, they should be saying calocheri and che instead of ke for end. Um, now, moving on to contact effects. Especially in the first generation, we, have, we find a lot of words that were borrowed from English into Cypriot Greek and which were crucially um, uh, phonologically and morphologically integrated into the, uh, the system of Cypriot Greek. So, uh, landlord became uh, lalos or lalos, uh, bus became topason, and kuka became uh, ikuka. Now, I see you, you, uh, you're laughing um, because these words have acquired a cert certain kind of style uh, um, implication. So they, they uh, uh, speakers consider them to be funny. I'm, I'm going to ask you later why you think they're funny. Uh, but f in terms of linguistics, they are actually uh, the best thing you can do to a foreign word. You take a foreign word and you adapt it to your, your native system and you turn it into, into Greek. You, you can use it in the singular, the plural, the nominative, the genitive, the accusative, and it, it doesn't exist in your language as a foreign word uh, because in Greek foreign words re remain uh, uninflected. Uh, but for different reasons, these words have acquired this sort of connotations of the first generation, a bit of uh, uneducated uh, kind of background. Um, in the second generation, this doesn't exist anymore. In the second generation, we have extensive lexical insertions and code switching. So you might find pe people saying, emis povakanum imperitu effort. We, we, make, we do the, we make extra effort, and effort will be pronounced in the British uh, English way. Or they might have whole phrases like Ethelana Vrojenekan with a head on her shoulders. I wanted to find a woman with the head on her shoulders. Um, 
Sometimes we find um, uh, differences in agreement. So, Eshimerikes um, lexis, there are certain words, puenen sosta. Now, in Greek, we have a gender agreement system. So, merikes lexis is feminine. So, the word sosta for correct at the end should be feminine as well. It should be sostes. Uh, but because this is a second generation speaker, uh, we see that they have a neuter agreement, a neuter form. Sometimes we have um, number agreement mismatches, uh, like maresi y parxenies tu cosmo. So Greek is like Spanish and Italian, where instead of saying you like, uh, I like something, you say to me it pleases. So here you should have maresun. So the aresi form should be aresun in the plural, because the syntactic subject y parxenies is in the plural. Instead you have uh, maresi in the singular. You also have number agreement in impersonal verbs, anentoishes eprepes naminis. Now, in Greek, um, a lot of modal verbs only occur in the third person singular form. So, this should be eprepe instead of eprepes naminis. This is a clear transfer from uh, English. Uh, differences in case marking, so prinambitin gipron mes in Evropin. This is in Kipron is in the accusative, whereas in, uh, it's the subject, so it should be prinambi i Kipros in the nominative form. And sometimes you have a lack of negative concord. Now, Greek is a language with negative concord. You have to have double negatives. Uh, whereas this speaker here says, pandote ήταν maxillari, it was always maxillari, the word for pillow. Pote ήταν mavluka. There you have a missing negator. You should have pote en itan mavluka. Now, what's interesting, though, is that none of these deviant structures occur systematically in the speech of any of the second generation speakers that we interviewed as part of our uh, series. So, which means that these speakers will uh, make those errors or mistakes uh, in passing, but none of these will be systematic. So, for the most part, uh, the Greek will be um, correct. Now, I had to prepare some more, but I don't have much time. So, moving on to the social linguistic status of Cypriot Greek here in London, um, we find three main, uh, three main languages in the repertoire. We find Cypriot Greek that is used among family members' friends, both in and outside the house. We find English, which is used in all interactions with speakers from outside the community and also among British-born Greek Cypriots. And of course, standard Greek that is used in all formal aspects of the community administration and activities, so in schools, in church, and the media. So this is the distribution of Cypriot Greek and standard Greek is the same as in Cyprus, but here we crucially have the addition of English as the majority language. So how are the two Greek varieties used in, uh, in the parikia, in the expatriate community? So you see here the front page of a Greek Cypriot newspaper from some time ago, and you see there on the, on the left uh, uh, the title of an article, Agenis Trasis ke Chorkatos, or Erdogan. Chorkatos is a very uh, distinctively Cypriot word. It means something like a yoko or a country bumpkin, someone who's uncouth and lacks in manners. It is not standard Greek, but it is used in the newspaper. When it's used in the newspaper, it's put in those Greek uh, quotation marks. Yeah, they look like the French quotation marks. Why would they need to do this? They need to do this because Cypriot Greek doesn't have a place on the front page of a newspaper. It's not supposed to be written, it's not supposed to be in the title of a serious article, but because we talk, we're talking about Recep Tayyip Erdogan, someone that we don't like very much, and we want to attribute this label to him, we'll make this concession and use the dialect to describe him, because this is the only word that truly describes him, but still we need to put it in quotation marks, otherwise it would look like the dialect has a legitimate place on the front of this newspaper. This is, these are two screenshots from, um, uh, from a Greek TV show on, on Hellenic TV. So the show is called Expatriate Community, This is London. So you have the presenter of it on one hand, and then you have another character, Fanula, who's a half-crazy aunt who lives in North London. So if I asked you to guess which one of the two speaks standard Greek and which one of the two speaks Cypriot Greek, I'm sure you'd all get it right. So what kind of image does this paint about the speakers of Cypriot Greek and what, what kind of image does it paint about who speaks standard Greek? So um, we know that 
in, in 2001, Papa Pavlo and Pavlo did, uh, did a study on uh, the, the, the degree of use of the two languages, uh, Cypriot Greek and English, in the community. So here you see the uh, percentages of use of Cypriot Greek and English among 12 to 18 year olds uh, plotted against different members of the family. So you have grandparents, uncles, aunts, father, mother, cousins, siblings and friends. So you see that the use of the dialect, the home language, is high only with grandparents and 75.5%. When you move to younger members of the family, uh, as you come closer to your siblings and friends, the use of the dialect drops dramatically to 1.4% and the use of English is up to 87.6%. So if you start thinking about it, why would it be so high with uh, grandparents? It's clearly because they might not have such a good command of English in the first place. So speaking Greek with them is a matter of necessity. And with the people that you have a choice to speak English, like your parents who are out here and for work so they know uh, English, or with your cousins and siblings who are probably born here, like you, you speak English and you don't use um, the dialect. So um, English was seen as posing the most significant threat to the vitality of the dialect in London very early on. Um, so the use of English at home was seen as uh, the sort of major threat in the protective fortress of um, the home, the Cypriot Greek speaking environment. Um, early researchers also talked about those non-reciprocal interactions, which is a situation where the parent will speak to the child in Greek and the child will reply uh, in English. And of course, the change in dominance in the transition from the first to the second generation. And already in Aksagoro in 1990 concluded that the process of abandonment which is underway among the second generation leaves no space for optimism about the maintenance of the Cypriot dialect in the third or fourth generations. Now, in terms of attitudes, uh, a lot of researchers agree that the dialect is viewed positively in London by its speakers. Uh, speakers consider it to be a symbol of their ethnic identity, their immigrant history, and a point of reference with a distinct culture. And according to these researchers, English and Greek are not thought to be competing by these speakers, but are thought of as fulfilling different communi uh, communicational needs. And Papa Pavlo and Pavlo even um, uh, go as far as to say that there are no signs of negative attitudes towards Cypriot Greek, which UK Cypriots seem to master at higher levels than modern standard Greek. And I'm going to show you that this is not true. Already in um, 1990, Alonephtis uh, did an, uh, a study of the experiences of British-born Greek Cypriots went to Cyprus on their summer holiday. And she found that they, uh, that Cyprus-born Cypriots deride the way UK-born Cypriots speak when they visit Cyprus. When they speak English, they are accused of pretentiousness and snobbery. So when they try and speak Greek instead, they are mocked and considered uncouth due to the high number of basilectal features that they use. So basically they, they are either thought to be uh, pretending to be British or to be talking like their grandparents from 60 years ago and no one speaks like that anymore. In Cyprus there is even um, an expression um, that, is, that applies predominantly to British-born Cypriots and the way they speak uh, Greek and this, this expression is fakai glossosu, which basically means your tongue clicks. So when uh, they um, encounter a speaker who speaks Cypriot Greek with a little bit of an accent, they will say to them, oh, but your tongue clicks, fakai glossosu. And this is not viewed positively by, by British-born speakers. So this is Stevie Georgiou, he's an uh, online celebrity or celebrity to become, um, and he, posts, uh, he posted this uh, some months ago, Happy New Year guys, now there's one sentence that I get every single bloody day in Cyprus where he lives, Mafakai Glossosu, yes Sherlock Holmes, I know that I speak with a bit of an accent, there's no need to state the obvious now. I do find it quite rude if I'm totally honest, as I, nev as I never tell anybody that they speak English a little dodgy if they're from another country. It's a bit of a pain in the backside. Instead of appreciating that the opposite person speaks two languages, some individuals have to pick and poke at the faults. My blood pressure. So what did we find uh, in our investigations of attitudes in uh, the community? We found that, of course, Cypriot Greek is a part of the identity of British-born Cypriots. 
uh, like Marius, for example, he says that he likes to speak, uh, likes to speak my language. I do not want to lose the Greek language. I do not want to lose the fact that I am Cypriot, because I think that if I lose the language, I will not be Cypriot anymore. I will not feel that I'm 100% Cypriot. So there's a clear association between the language and being Cypriot. However, we do find that intergenerational transmission does break uh, between the first and second generation. So Stella says that at our home, we did not speak Greek to our children. This is wrong. I know it is wrong, but they are very young. And I want them to know English well, to know many words. But there are negative attitudes towards the variety. Because speakers do refer to it as Horkatka, Villagi, and Vareta, heavy. So Kyriakos says that for me, Cypriot Greek is like it's from the village. And the mainland Greeks are, you know, from the city. So the divide between rural and urban is still very present uh, here in London as well. But they also describe Cypriot Greek as spasmena, which means broken. Uh, so, for example, Adamus, Adamus says that Greek here in London is broken, uh, which is clearly a transfer of the English label for non standard forms of English. But when you ask, he later on goes to say that. The very broken type has che. Che is a Cypriot Greek word for end. It has a che sound that uh, is not found in standard Greek. But this is normal for monolingual Cypriot Greek speakers. It's not an error, it's not a mistake, it's not an ungrammatical structure. In English, broken is usually applied to structures from, say, Jamaican English or African American English that are thought to be ungrammatical in standard English terms. But this is not an ungrammatical structure, it's just a, a, a different a variant phonological variant of Cypriot Greek. Among some speakers, the use of material marked as Cypriot Greek is considered to be uh, improper and incorrect. So this speaker, Anna, very well-educated uh, speaker, says, well, I don't say che yo. Che yo is, basically means me too. Uh, but both the words che and, and yo, I, are in the Cypriot basilectal form. So why do you not say? Because it's not correct. Yes, but it's not an error. It's not a mistake. No, no, I'm a believer in speaking correctly. And why do people say it? It's laziness. So again, the sort of uh, British explanation for non the use of non-standard features, that they, the people who don't speak with uh, a standard accent are just lazy. So instead, the use of standard Greek is considered to be proper and polite. So according to Elia, if I'm talking with someone from Greece, I feel that I too have to make the effort, let's say, to be polite and say ke instead of che. So it all boils down to how you say and. If you want to sound polite, you have to say ke. If you want to sound like if you're from the village, you say che or you avoid that altogether. So. Unsurprisingly, we found that these negative perceptions are rooted in the community's educational system. So this is the experience of uh, a speaker from, um, when she gave, she gave us this testimony, she was, uh, I think, 36 years of age, and this happened to her when she was six. Uh, she said, I remember when I was in the first grade of Greek school, one day I was late and there was no chair for me to sit. And I said to the teacher, I don't have a tsaera. Tsaera is a Cypriot word for chair. And the teacher gave me that look. She said, what is that? Chair, I said, chair in English. And she said, it's not saera, it's karekla. Karekla is the Greek word, standard Greek word for, for chair. So imagine this, the, 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 the child asks for a chair to sit on and is treated with contempt. Like, what is this? I don't understand what you're saying. Now, the teacher wanted the, the, the child to use a standard Greek word, karekla. But this child was born in the UK. It's, the, it's first grade, so she's six, so it's the first time she's a Greek school. How was she supposed to know the Greek word if she grew up in a Cypriot Greek speaking household? And faced with this, the, the child, what did she do? She spoke English. Chair, I said, in English. So basically, the, 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 the purpose of education in this case, which was to, for her to learn the Greek word, failed. And What's more telling is the sort of self-reflection that she went on to make. And then I realized that the Cypriot that I knew, the Cypriot that I had learned was heavy Cypriot. So then I realized I didn't speak correctly. I spoke in a mistaken way. And this is a six-year-old making these reflections about the way she speaks her home language. 
Negative perceptions are also present in less formal settings within the community. So here we have another speaker who says that when we were young, when someone would come to visit, we would talk to our parents with a peasanty sort of accent. So my mother would say, this word is not correct if we try to use it. If you use it, it is not correct. You have to use that other word because this one is peasanty. So people who come to visit cannot think that we are peasants because we use those words. And the third thing that we are now exploring are the tensions between London's diaspora and the Cyprus metropolis. Now in Cyprus, um, British-born UK Cypriots have their own label, they're called Charlies, uh, Charlides and Charlouis. Um, they are perceived by some as uneducated, unsophisticated and lacking in manners, which goes back to the nature of the first migration, because if the early migrants from Cyprus came from low socioeconomic backgrounds. In the UK, the stereotypical Cyprus-born Greek Cypriot, especially one from the modern day, has all the characteristics of the provincial nouveau riche. They are considered to be conceited, arrogant, and ostentatious. So, for example, uh, Savas told us, when I, uh, he was talking how he went to, on holiday to Rhodes, the Greek island, I asked him what the people are like. He said the people are simpler in Rhodes, like the Cypriots used to be. The Cypriots are very are conceited nowadays. Fantasmeni is a Greek word that means someone who thinks too highly of themselves. And also this expression is very uh, prominent. Um, if we go to Cyprus, they know we are English because as they say to me, my tongue clicks. So there is a growing cleavage between the, the British community and the community in Cyprus in terms of how English, in terms of how Greek is spoken. And this is put very vividly by Yorgos, who says that their language, the people in Cyprus, has changed so much that I do not understand them anymore. I do not understand them and they do not understand me. First, they do not use anymore the words that I know. Second, their accent has moved to the direction of Greek, so their language changed a lot. To me, they seem like liars. Why speak standard Greek if you are Cypriot? We have our own language. Why do you not speak it? So, what we're trying to say what I'm trying to argue is that these attitudes lead to a preference for the use of standard Greek among the community in general. Like Vespina says, I understand both Cypriot Greek and standard Greek now because I learned it at school, but when I speak, I try to speak the Greek way rather than the Cypriot way. So, seeing as you hang out with Cypriot people mostly, why do you try to speak Greek? That's what we were taught at school. There were priests and the church. This is because a lot of the Greek schools operate within uh, churches and there is this very strong uh, religious um, at, uh, element there. And Christala says, for example, well, very often I do not want my children to learn the type of Greek that I speak because it is not a perfect model. I prefer for them to hear standard Greek. So, to sum up, um, what we're finding uh, in our research is that super Greek is an indispensable part of London's linguistic mosaic. The parikia, the community, has a very rich linguistic repertoire from which its members draw to fulfill their communicative needs and to signal their belonging to the UK's Greek Cypriot community. However, there is a steady decline in the use of Cypriot Greek by the younger generations. Um, I'm arguing that Cypriot Greek is threatened not only by English as a majority language, but also due to its perceived inferior sta status with respect to standard Greek and to the way that Cypriot Greek is presently spoken in Cyprus. Positive perceptions of standard Greek and a mixture of positive and negative perceptions of Cypriot Greek have been transplanted from Cyprus to London. Attitudes in London are preserved and reinforced by the same social institutions as in the original context of Cyprus, with the complementary schools playing a key role in engendering these, native, these negative attitudes. The attitude-driven practice that we find in London schools show high degrees of similarity to the ones in Cyprus. However, unlike in Cyprus, uh, in London, the use of Cypriot Greek is discouraged even in informal settings, such as the home environment. Altogether, these practices lead to a community-wide preference for the use of standard Greek in communication, even with members of the Greek Cypriot community, which I believe poses another serious threat to the intergenerational transmission and maintenance of the dialect as a heritage language in London, in addition to the pressure that is exerted by English. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Uh, we have about 20 minutes for questions. We'll start.
please. <laughs> Well, you, you said that we laughed at landlords. That's what my parents used to. You know, that's, we laughed because my parents used to say landlords, and it was because they, they just they couldn't get their tongues round things like that. I mean, it was just impossible for them to say landlord. Impossible. So as kids, we always used to laugh at landlords. The other thing they always say, and I say it, we say it, is "bato kettle on put the kettle on. And to this day, I don't know what the kettle is in Greek. I've got no idea. Yeah. Kettle. Yeah. It's kettle. Twice. Bagheta, Bagheta. Yeah. No, 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 no. yeah. I mean, our parents came from Cyprus many In the 30s. In the 30s. They came in the 30s. And we were, well, you said the droughts of 32, 33. That's why our dad ah. came over in 1934. Because if he hadn't have come to find some work here, to send money back to Cyprus, to pay taxes to the British government, then they would have confiscated some of his mm. land. He didn't want to. And when he came here, it, it was worse in London than it was in Cyprus, mm -hmm. actually. And they stuck here. My mum came over, they got married, and uh, never went back. Yeah. But we learned Greek at home, Cypriot Greek. Um, and when we went to primary school, I mean, it was just easy. Kids absorb yeah, but languages. Would, my mum wouldn't let us say to her. She no, she wouldn't. She said, okay. she, yes, a lot, a lot of things they used to. So very similar to these experiences. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I find it quite sad as well that when we go to Cyprus, the Cypriot or Cypriots sort of look down their noses. And you're right, Charlie and Charlie said. So. But we're not too old to be joking. Well, it's, <laughs> it's the younger ones. <laughs> Thank you very much, that was very interesting. Um, so you mentioned that there's complementary schools, yes. right? And uh, I'm just wondering if there's a you know, policy in the school about mm -hmm. the use of uh, you know, two types of uh, reading. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, I didn't have enough time. Um, there is, there is um, an authority uh, called the Cyprus Educational Mission. Uh, it's an office uh, in North London uh, with um, staff uh, directly from Cyprus, set up by the Ministry of Education of Cyprus. Uh, the purpose is to oversee uh, the education that's provided in the complementary schools. Um, they have a curriculum. Uh, it's not a full-blown one. Uh, it's not one that was commissioned by the Cypriot government. It was one that was sort of, um, sort of ground roots movement here that they wrote it because they needed some kind of guidance uh, for the teachers. Um, I think that the Cypriot Greek dialect is mentioned once in the curriculum as being part of the identity of the students, and that's it. There is no real uh, policy about how to take. Um, the linguistic repertoire of the students into account in designing teaching and learning uh, practice. So I, uh, this is a project that Alexander and I are currently doing uh, with in-class observations in two schools to see what actually happens in, uh, in the classrooms because everything that I showed you is from, from what people told us. Um, but no, the answer, the answer is no. So I'm just curious about the language attitudes among the teachers mm. and the classroom language is one thing, but the, you know, whether they would be willing to, I mean, so um, the medium instruction, in, of in instruction as opposed to talking to children, mm. you know, during the break or right after the classes and so forth, I, I'm just wondering if the teacher would try not to use the, um, you know, the, the Separate um, mm -hmm. Greek, or you know, so I'm just curious about, about that. Um, now, uh, even in Cyprus, and of course, here in London, um, they might try not to speak Cypriot Greek, but they will never succeed. Uh, like, if, if you're someone like me who I'm from Greece, I will always be able to tell that the teachers are speaking uh, with either a Cypriot accent or they will use the Cypriot word without really knowing it. Uh, they avoid certain features, like this ch sound, for example, but others will. <coughs> always be there. And in London, we have the additional uh, presence of English. So in our, in our observation so far, the speakers use standard, Cypriot, and English in class for instruction. 
because they know that if they don't do that, this, the, the pupils will basically understand very little of what they're saying. So I, I'm interested, and thank you very much again, very interesting. I'm interested in parallel between what you're saying about, about this particular case study and, and others that I've seen. So for example, one of my former PhD students looked at the teaching of um, Kurdish in, actually in adult education classes in, this, in, in London. Is it bad girl? Yes, okay. So it's very similarly found that, that the more rustic, let's say, um, uh, the more regional varieties were, were frowned upon in the classes. And, and like you said, with the example of the, the TV program, you know, she too showed the example of that as, as, as a, you know, kind of stereotypical views of how people speak. So I think this thing is the kind of thing is happening all over. I was also interested in, in the, the when we talked about the um, attrition processes. In my, in my own research, I found very similar research uh, um, things that are happening in Jersey and Guernsey with people who, let's say, are perhaps semi speakers, um, might be described as bilinguists. Um, similar things happening, losing um, agreements uh, um, uh, of, of gender, of number, etc., particularly. Yeah. Yeah, um, thank you for this. Um, as it happens, um, uh, we're hosting a symposium in two weeks' time at a conference in, uh, in Crete uh, on uh, non-standard forms of diaspora languages. We have a panel of experts from different uh, communities in the first attempt to look at the similarities and differences, and Virgil is one of the panelists. Um, Alexander and I were presenting on uh, standard Greek, and I think and she said to uh, our other colleague from, uh, she's from the Turkish Cypriot community, will present her data from that community, uh, which is a very, very similar to what we find in the Greek Cypriot community. So this is a, um, a transfer from an in-class observation that she did, which basically the teacher, the children use one form, the teacher tells them, don't use it, use the other one that is from Turkey. And they say, but I use that one with my, my dad or my granddad. So it's very, it's very similar. Um, we know that we have plans to create a more a network of people who work on uh, on these areas um, because we need this comparative aspect. Um, and yeah, the attrition—it's it's the usual. Thing. Um, do you know in this case if there are younger generations of Cypriot Greek speakers who are who are sort of pushing for the maintaining the language or using it? Do you say things like that here in London? Um, uh, no. Um, what I find, because um, um, I'm quite involved in um, uh, with the community as well, and I'm, I'm, I frequently go and talk about it in non-academic contexts, um, they all sympathise. They all say, "Oh, you're right. Oh, we should do something about it," but they they don't. They, and by the time this message reaches them, they're already dominant in English. And even if they want to, they, they would struggle to do anything. And um, another common pattern that I found is that they might be very um, negative towards it in younger ages. And by the time they grow older, they sort of rethink, oh, actually, it might have been a good idea if I spoke Greek to my children. Or it might have been a good idea if I spoke more Greek myself. Uh, sort of reinventing yeah. your heritage, basically. Um, so yeah, it's not very positive. It's very English. difficult for people who were born here yeah. to speak Greek. Not my sister, we never speak Greek together. together. Mm. But we can speak Greek. Yeah. So and friends of ours were born here. Their children were born here. Their grandchildren. So Greek is virtually yeah. uh, non-existent. It's, 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 it's something that hap happens a lot in, in, in language maintenance and revitalization. Um, people, if people are really going to do this, they need to make, make a, 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 a muda, it's a life, life changing decision to actually use their heritage language with, yeah. with each other. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it has to be something that you actually take an yeah. active decision to do. What, uh, uh, follow up? Um, I was just, I was wondering how much, uh, because you did mention about people um, taking trips to Cyprus, um, how much contact do people have with people in Cyprus, how many people
people are going taking trips back and forth or spending summers and stuff. Is, is that is that all common? It's, it's very common, common. yeah. It's okay. very very common. Okay. And it's it's become more common, obviously, yeah. in recent decades with cheaper sure. flights and yeah. easier ways yeah. of getting there. It used to take us a week to go to the summer. Yeah. It's, it's very cool. I went last weekend for two days. Questions? <laughs> I actually have one. Okay. Um, this is not sort of, this might be difficult to answer, and it's not directly related to this necessarily, but I was wondering why, why, why sort of Cypriot Greek never became the standard language, um, if, if, if there's sort of a reason. I mean, I'm sure there's many reasons why it was. As in standard language in terms of uh, being written yes. in the media, um, Now, Greek has a very old history of diglossia. And when we say old, we talk about millennia. So uh, already in the, Attic, the, the Atticism movement is a movement in the Hellenistic times, which is around 300 BC to 300 AD, where uh, Greek speakers decided that uh, they shouldn't write the way they speak. So they should always write in a form that is, goes back in time, like in the classical times, or always something else than the spoken language. So this, uh, the, the roots of this idea are very, very deep. Um, and then later on, as the modern Greek dialects started to develop, like Cypriot Greek, they were originally written. As it happens, one of the early, some of the earliest uh, medieval Greek um, dialectal writing works of literature come from Cyprus, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like the Leontius Machiras poems or um, uh, laws, even the Assis in, uh, were written in Cypriot Greek. But then with the, the rise of nationalism and the relations of, with Greece, uh, the language of Greece always was thought to be the standard, the one that we had to use. Um, so in, uh, Cyprus follows Greece in terms of the uh, language policy always. Um, there was, however, an attempt to change things. Um, so in 2010, uh, a new uh, curriculum was published. Uh, the National Curriculum for Public Schools of the Republic of Cyprus, by Hans Sabrius Kostoulian in 2010. Now this um, curriculum was the first one ever in Cyprus that aimed for students to acquire a full overview of the structure of Standard Greek and of the Cypriot Greek variety, to view the Cypriot diet as a variety which displays systematicity, and for children to be able, students to be able to analyze a range of hybrid texts and to basically apply um, critical literacy to the multilingual and multicultural society of Cyprus. Um, and the, so this curriculum didn't aim at introducing the teaching of Cypriot Greek. There wasn't going to be a Cypriot Greek hour mm -hmm. in the curriculum. They only aimed at using the Cypriot Greek dialect as a resource for developing the student's literacy in the standard. Mm -hmm. So um, what you say in Cypriot Greek in this way, you say in the standard in that way. Mm -hmm. um, now this was introduced in 2010. Um, I think in 2013 there was a change of government in, in Cyprus from uh, a left-wing to right-wing government. Uh, and some uh, conservative circles um, view this or interpret this as a move away from Greece. So you're giving the state, uh, status to the Cypriot dialect mm -hmm. by doing this, which means you're moving away from the motherland of Greece. Mm -hmm. um, the curriculum was put under review and withdrawn in 2015. Uh, <coughs> so we're back to the old curriculum, which basically has no place for the dialect mm -hmm. in it. Uh, there are strong ideological reasons for why it's not standardized. Mm -hmm. People view that if you standardize it, you, you elevate it to a language, mm -hmm. and it's not a language. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. It's a yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> it's complicated. And, then, and so, well, uh, so, apart from this, was there never a feeling among Cypriots that? <coughs> I mean, people might have, if you, if you ask people, they'll tell you. It's a language. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll tell you we should write it. They'll mm -hmm. tell you there should be a description of it. But how can you write it? Oh, very how do you write Cypriot? Oh, you can write it. You can put like hats on mm -hmm. letters. You can use different combinations. People do write it, uh, but there is no standardized system. 
Um, different publishers will use different systems, uh, but there's no unique, uniquely and mutually agreed uh, system. Mm -hmm. We have time for another very brief question, which I also have to ask. <laughs> I have a question. I see you every day. Go on. <laughs> yes, I'm a good task. Do you think that um, in the future there there will be a standardization of Cypriot? I mean, the linguists will say we can never predict the future, so I, I don't know. What was the question? That there will, will there be what? A standardization of secret, because there are these not quite sort of political question, perhaps, mm. yeah? I mean, if ever the, <coughs> the good relations between Greece and Cyprus break, mm. and if we ever stop giving each other 12 points in the Eurovision <laughs> contest, <laughs> then maybe <laughs> the conditions will be right for this kind of movement, <laughs> uh, but I don't see that happening any time soon. Shall we end on this maybe not so much for well, I don't know what that's all. But yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.